It's a wonderful day to be alive in Jesus. But that's the key. You have to be alive in him. For anybody who isn't alive in him, though they may be living, they're dead. If one is not alive in Jesus, then they, like the show, The Walking Dead. So Father, we thank you that we are alive in you this day. We thank you that you have given us another opportunity, Father God, to represent you. You've given us an opportunity to make things right in this life so that we, Father God, have peace with you as well as the peace of you. So, Holy Spirit of God, even now as we assemble in this place, I thank you. Speak your wonderful words of life through my voice, through my lips, in the name of Jesus. Say that my eyes are open, open. and I see the perfect will of God. God. My ears are open, open. and I hear God's voice voice. clearly Clearly. every time. time. My heart is open, open. and I obey his voice voice. willingly. And promptly in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Questions from the last teaching? Aaron, any questions from the last teaching? If you do, raise your hand and the usher will bring you a mic. I'd also like to kind of do a little bit of a poll and I want you to give me feedback as to what you have learned so far. Um, from these teachings so I can see where we are, make sure that we all understand clearly God's um, word and his expectation of us, okay? So questions first. Any questions? Okay. Do we need clarification to clarify anything that we have taught so far? Okay. I'm going to put forth some questions to you then. Is the church important? Who is the church? Why is the church important? Raise your hands so that an usher can come to you. You can speak into the mic. Why is the church important? When I say why is the church important, I'm basically asking why are you important? (laughs) Yes. Because we're the hands and feet of Jesus. Because we are the hands and feet of Jesus, the hands and feet of Jesus, the body. Yes. Because God commanded us to love one another. Because God commanded us to love one another. Yes. Good. Yes. Uh, To fill the great commission. Uh Uh-huh. Discipleship in the great command of Mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. So to fulfill the great commission, the great commandment. Of course, in the Great Commission is yes, to make disciples, yes. For discipleship, fellowship, prayer, ministry to each other, worship to God, fellowship with one another, and evangelism or outreach. Uh huh, uh huh. That's important, meaning those are the, yeah, those are the purposes for the church, yes. I was pretty much going to say to finish what Jesus started. Okay, and I love that part, to finish what he started. Yes. Well, the church is like the glue. The and church is like the glue? The glue. Okay. Yes. And without it, without the commitment to a church, it's like shacking up. Okay, it's usually <laughs> wham. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So yeah, yeah. We'll we'll work that back in there for the sake of those who are hearing that for the first time. <laughs> okay. All right. Any others? Well, it's kind of similar to that. The glue, meaning, like the church. We are here, and we're holding this world from being in total chaos. Because once we leave, then it will be. And uh, so then also we're. Of course, the commission is to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Okay, all right. Okay, you made a good point, and then yes, and we said it before that the church is, okay, you said the glue. Um, Brother Kenny said it's what's holding the world from just going to pot, 
Okay. Um, how, how do we know that, scripturally speaking? What scripture would it be that would validate that the world basically would go to pot without the church? How do we know that in scripture? Because yes, I have given a lot of thought to that, especially this week. Um, so how do we know that? Who can tell me? Is there any reference in scripture? Do you know of any reference in scripture that would speak to that? It's important that you know. Because this speaks to how important you are, because we are the church. The church isn't the building. This is just a temple of worship. But we are the church. And so I believe I've said it also before in these terms, that the church is the stabilizing force for this world, for this earth. We're the stabilizing force. However, if we're the stabilizing force, a force usually would indicate that there is power, right? So God didn't intend for the church to be weak. He intended for the church to be powerful because we're operating in his power and with his power, right? Okay, now, this is what also he told me. I gotta find where he told me. He told me a lot of stuff. Okay, uh, no, that's not it. Uh, oh, okay. You might wanna write this down. We, the church that is, we cannot bind what we permit. We cannot bind what we permit. We can only bind what we do not permit through a verbal decree and then corresponding action. We can only bind what we do not permit through a verbal decree and then corresponding action. Now the whole idea of not, of we not being able to bind what we permit is that anything we don't permit, it first has to be because God doesn't permit it. Okay, so this is according to God's standard. We live in an age now where everything is deemed right or wrong based upon the law of the land. Okay, now, should we respect or render some level of respect and allegiance to, in this case, this nation? Some level of respect, yes, some. However, when it's to the point where they are wanting to dictate things that clearly are in opposition to God's truth, then that is when we have to say, no, we're not going to permit that. I don't care what your law says, because that law does not stand up against God's law. So if you take what they're trying to make legal in this nation, which is in opposition to God's law, if you're trying to uphold that, then God is going to have an issue with you. And you can't pray against it, you can't bind it, you can't vote against it when you also support it or condone it or have a silent voice when it comes to it. Okay? Now, What's mostly on the radar these days is when it comes to homosexuality, lesbianism, the whole LGBTQ and all the other alphabets that they want to throw in there. Um, and what I'm finding more and more is that people who call themselves church are wanting for us to be accepting and tolerant of that lifestyle. And the law of the land is now wanting to legalize and call marriage between two, well, call the union or whatever of two men or two women. They're wanting to also call that marriage, as is the case between a man and a woman. That is not a marriage. Now, 
I have a few things to say when it comes to this. And I was like, Lord, Jesus, <laughs> really? He said, yes. I said, you know I'll say whatever you want me to say, right? He said, yes. Uh, so this is also still in, in keeping with the teaching that I'm doing on the church. Um, and that's because the church as we said, is supposed to be the stabilizing force that keeps all of, <laughs> all of the world and the earth just burning up, okay? Now, how's that gonna happen if the church is aligned with the world system? You, you, I mean, you can't, you can't agree with the book. It says it right there in the book that all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. How is the church going to be, going to be lust in the flesh, lust in the eyes, and, and, and having pride in life, okay, and yet at the same time want to change it? Okay? You're a light when you're in the midst of darkness. You can't shine up darkness when you're dark. You can only illuminate darkness when you're full of light Amen. and when you are the light. And the light shines because it's in the midst of darkness, not among other lights, okay? So this is where all of us as lights, we get our light shining brighter so that when we go out into the world system, then we just set everything ablaze, okay? But you can't do that if you're agreeing with the world. The church is supposed to stand out as a bright light and be different. Yes. I saw a quote this week. You cannot make a difference unless you are different. Amen. Amen. You cannot make a difference unless you are different. Okay? Which means that it's they who's differing with you, not you differing with them. And that's because the truth and the light of God was here first. What we also have to understand is that, okay, let's take one word, write this word down on your notepad. I'm gonna give it to you after I take a sip of this mystery liquid in here. Ready to write? Write down the word imperfect. Imperfect. What does that word mean? Imperfect. What does that word mean? Give me some natural definitions of the word imperfect. Speak into the mic. Having a defect. Having a defect. Okay. Okay. I also heard not perfect. What else? Flawed. Flawed. Okay. All right. Imperfect, having a defect, not perfect, flawed. Okay, now, this is the thing about, we'll just focus on this one word, imperfect, and then I'm gonna have you give me a few other ones once you get an idea of where I'm headed. You can't have imperfection mm -hmm. unless there was first perfection. Amen. Because imperfection can't be created. Only perfection can. The devil doesn't have the capacity to create anything. He can only pervert what God has created. So imperfection is there because perfection was first on the scene. So imperfection isn't anything new. It's just a perversion of the actual perfection which was here first. Let me give you another one. Darkness is a perversion of light. Darkness was not here first. It says that God is light. And so in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And it says that God is light, which means that God was here first which means light was here first. So then darkness is a perversion of light, 
because darkness is an absence of light. You can't create darkness. It was light that was created and then perverted and then that was called darkness. Now when I look up the word perverse or perversion, it says one can only rebel against truth, not error. We said that a long time ago. One can only rebel against truth. You cannot rebel against error. You can only rebel against truth. Now perverse by description is turned away from the right. Perverse doesn't just mean turned away. Perverse means turned away from the right. Another description, willfully erring, willfully. Perverse means wicked. Perverse means obstinate in the wrong. Perverse means stubborn. Perverse means intractable, meaning out of control. Hence, wayward and contrary. Now, in the Greek, we have some Greek origin to this word perverse. The Greek meanings and Hebrew meanings, actually, I just lumped them all together because it was just so much. Okay, so the Greek and the Hebrew meanings both align. The descriptions in the Greek and Hebrew are distorted, corrupted, crooked, out of place. I like this one, strange. (laughs) Perverse, another description, twisted. (laughs) To deviate, to depart, to turn, to warp, and to destroy. When it comes to perversion, no one can take a good and right thing and actually make it innately bad and wrong. You can't make it innately bad and wrong. Actually, all people or all one can do is take that good thing and take that right thing or take that thing, rather, which was originally good and right, and then pervert it. You can't make something that is good and right bad. If it were the case, then that means you could do that with God. And he said, I change not. He is innately good. He is, he is, he is good and goodness. Okay? And he can't change. He can't be anything outside or other than his character. That's right. He doesn't have the capacity to be or do or say anything outside of his character because he is good and he is goodness. All right? So you can't actually make light darkness. You can't make it innately that. You have to take it and pervert it. But just because you pervert it doesn't mean that that's actually what it innately is. Are you all with me so far? So for example, what is a baseball bat for? To play baseball. Okay, that is what it was designed to do. Do people use it for other things? Like what? To cause skull damage. (laughs) What? To cause skull damage. To cause skull damage, he says. Yes. To bust a window out of a car. To bust a window out of a car. Okay. Yes. Or protection. 
for protection. See, she's wanting to err on the nice side of things. <laughs> okay, all right. So, but we hear it can be used for a lot of different things. Okay, huh? Bust a window, just like she'd say, see, 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 two of you are on the same page. You're into busting up windows. Okay, but the thing is, even though it can be used for that, that doesn't mean that's what it was designed to do. Okay, does that make the baseball bad? No, it's neutral, okay? It's gonna do whatever the holder tells it to do, okay? But the baseball itself is neutral. Give me another example. You take, you give me one. Naturally. A what? A basketball, okay. A basketball is for what purpose? To shoot, to play basketball, okay. What else could it be used for other than that? I'm, I'm, I'm actually curious to find out what else you can do with a basketball. Use it for dodgeball. Mm. You can use it for dodgeball, okay? All right, yes. E huh? even, <laughs> even within the game of basketball, if tempers flare, they'll take it and throw it and hit each other or hit each other in the face or throw it at them, whatever. Right, right, right. Okay, so they use it to hit each other instead of it going in the net. Okay, all right, give me another one. Yes. Okay, so I would say like a pill. Say what? Like a pain pill. A pain pill. Like, a, I just thought out like ibuprofen or something. Okay. So its original intent is to temporarily relieve pain. Okay. But people use it as a means of maybe relieving some pain that's not physical, like mental pain to get high. Okay. And they abuse it continuously. Okay. okay, okay. So what was supposed to serve as a pain medication, they used to maybe treat some kind of mental illness. Okay, so it's an abuse of the thing. Okay, give me another one. Yes. Uh, I was going to say golf because it takes a lot of skills and practice to play golf. Okay, golf. Okay, so what are we going to misuse, the ball or the... Huh? Okay. You, you got different sets, so it depends on which one you're using and how you're going to use it. Okay, but can a can a golf club be misused? Yeah. For what? To hit. So, so we saying another skull. Uh, okay, bashing another skull. All right, so it can be misused. Yes. Well, well I, I think I kind of got off. I thought we were talking about the basketball because I have a basketball player and I've seen her use it to prop open the door to prop open the door. Okay. 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 But, of course, but of course, that's not what it was designed, designed to, do. to do. Okay, one more, yes. A knife. A knife, that's a good one. Okay, why were, what is the purpose for a knife? For cutting, okay. Well, clearly it does that. What is it supposed to cut? Okay, if you make, if the, if the, let's say that you are the creator, okay, and you decide that you want to make a knife that is to be used at the dining table, and it's specifically for cutting food, okay, all of us know in this room that we use knives for other things, okay? Some people who are ill-intentioned and malicious may use it to cut someone instead of cut something on the plate. Okay, now does that mean that the knife is bad? No, it's just the misuse of it. Okay. We've already discussed a number of different things which you would therefore otherwise call, let's say, neutral. Okay? 
designed for a particular purpose. However, anything outside of that purpose would be called perverted, misuse, abuse. All right. Now, in the law, the law of this land, they're basically wanting to state that what God created when it comes to sex, that that can be between a man, it can be between a woman, it can be between two men, and it can be between two women. Now, the latter two are a perversion, and I don't care what anybody says. Now, when it comes to the church, the church has an assignment, and it tells us there in scripture that the church is supposed to be the pillar and ground of the truth. What is the truth when it comes to sex? What's the truth? It is supposed to be between a married male and female. Uh huh. Yes. And also, um, it's like the brother just said, between a man and a woman in marriage and used to um, procreate, well, to make children. And the mother and the father are supposed to make those children disciples. Okay, so it is to produce godly offspring. Is it the only God ordained purpose? No. Okay, otherwise, you all be having children for the rest of your life. Okay, so it's also for between the married man and woman for pleasure. Okay, and God is okay with that. All right, because some are going to be married and they're going to have children, some are going to be married, they're not going to have children. In both instances, it's okay as long as they're legally married, lawfully married. And I don't mean law of the land married, I mean law of God married. However, yes, we do do it in this land and we do abide by the land in terms of having a minister, a pastor, someone facilitate the union. But first and foremost, God has to approve it. Okay? Now, we all agree that that is the truth regarding sex? Yes? Okay. Now, the whole idea of homosexuals, two men being able to get together, two women being able to get together, that is an illegal concept. But the reason why it's illegal is because it's fathered by the devil and he is illegal. Yes, he is. Okay, I'm gonna try and track along in order, sorta, kinda. First of all, let's just review and make sure also that we agree. First Timothy 3.15 says, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, and that is the pillar and ground of the truth. We agree? Yes. Colossians 1 in the NIV, if I can get this, please. Colossians 1, verse 18 and verse 24. And that's because in prior teachings, we had said that the body of Christ is the church. And he is the head. So then if you take a look at my body, look up, look up at me, okay? The head here, this would represent Christ. All of this, all the way down, represents us. So we are his body, okay? So he can have a idea and a thought, but he is relying on us to execute and to carry it out. He says we are the head. Colossians 1, 18 and 24 in the NIV, please. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. 
so that in everything he might have the supremacy. In 24. Mm-hmm. Now I rejoice in what I am suffering for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, which is the church. He says, for the sake of, for the sake of his body, his body, which is the what? The The church. So the church is his body, which means that if you are not a member of a local body, you are not attached to his body. You are the church when you are attached. You are the church when you are attached. And in this case, we do that through membership. And that's because he very clearly states in his scripture that we are members of his body. And so we actually acknowledge that by receiving in people as members, which then makes it very plain that they have agreed to become a member of his body. Your role could be a finger, it could be a, it could be a toe, it could, it could be a fingernail. Do you know a fingernail is important? Why, how important is a fingernail, doctor? Doctor, how important is a fingernail? It's excellent for protection and also for scratching. For scratching. Uh huh. And also, even though we don't think about it, it assists with picking things up. Okay, and for picking things up and for protection. Now, let's say that we have fivefold gifts here apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, teacher, okay, for the perfecting of the saints, the work of the ministry, as Ephesians says. Let's say you're a fingernail for one of those then that means that even in your intercession, you could just be interceding. Your, your sole job could just be to intercede for me, which provides a level of spiritual protection, a fingernail. Yes. Do not underestimate your member role. That's right. Okay? Because Lord knows I need prayer. And it's not that I don't pray, because I do. However, there's nothing like having the church praying, okay? And that's for everyone, because we ought to pray for each other. Amen. Amen. There's nothing more powerful than that prayer. That's right. Okay? So, in Ephesians 5, NIV, Ephesians 5, 23. And uh, Sister Michelle, also in the NIV, can you pull up 1 Corinthians 12, 27? Let me get Ephesians 5, 23 first, and then 1 Corinthians 12, 27, both in the NIV. For the husband is the head of the wife, Mm -hmm. as Christ is the head of the church, Mm -hmm. his body, Mm -hmm. of which he is the Savior. So Christ is the Savior of his own body. So when it talks about here that a husband, he needs to love his wife as he loves himself, Jesus Christ, when he loves us, he's basically loving himself. Because we're his body. So when he says, I love you, he says, I love me too. (laughs) And so that's when Kenny said for us to sing, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then the Lord told him to tell us, I love you too. Uh, It's because he's loving himself. Because we are a part of his body. 1 Corinthians 12. Now, you are the body of Christ. Well then. And each one of you is a part of it. Each one of us is a part of it. Each one of us. Okay, how many of you appreciate it when a part of your body is not working well? Makes for a a long day. Okay, Um, so if there's a part of your body that is not wanting to work well when you get up in the morning, then you're like, oh, Lord, Jesus, okay? However, whatever part that is that decides that it wants to try and give you a little trouble, 
you seem to now need to spend more time and more attention focused on that area. Okay, so let's say that you wake up and you had pain in the arm. Anyone had pain in the arm? Or pain in a foot? Okay, and okay, let's say it's a pain in the foot. If it's a pain in the foot, are you able to walk normally like this? No, you're usually probably doing one of these. Okay, and all of your attention is now focused on that part that's not wanting to work so well. Okay, now, in the body of Christ, when one of us may be... <laughs> the foot, let's say you're a foot, okay, and it could be, it could be a number of different things. Let me, let, me, let me go at this softly, okay? Let's say that the devil is really trying to challenge you, okay? The rest of us as a body, we're going to feel that. But see, then as a body, what we do is now we are going to intercede and we are going to run to your aid so that we can work on getting you back whole again so that this body can get back running again. Amen. That's what the body is supposed to do. Now, on the other hand, if you're a foot and you decide to act up, we're also still going to pray for you, okay? And then we're going to have a come to Jesus meeting <laughs> so that you can get yourself together so that we can stop limping and get back to running again. Remember, a better you makes a better us, okay? Because we're a body, all right? So remember that if you are tempted, tempted now to act like a fool, don't do that because it impacts the whole body. You're not living just for yourself. None of us are living just for ourselves. We're living for all of us. Which is why we said last time, can a tree grow alone? Why not? Somebody was listening. <laughs> There's the seed, and it needs soil, and it needs sun, and it needs water, which means it's never alone. It can be the only tree standing out there in the middle of 10 acres, but it's still not alone. However, we also learned from Brother Vincent that they plant pecan trees and what trees together? And peach trees, so that they'll thrive. Okay, so the nutrient base is stronger when it's surrounded by others. That is why a vineyard is called what it is, a vineyard. I don't see a vineyard and then see one thing with just grapes. Usually it's rows. Okay, but that's how they thrive, is being planted together in rows like that. That's why it's called a vineyard. All right? So we agree that we are the body of Christ and we are members of it, yes? Amen. Okay, now, let's go to Romans chapter 1. Now, while you're turning there, just keep your spot there. Okay, in Romans 1. Write down the word illegal. Illegal. Mm -hmm. By description, it's contrary to. Illegal. In violation of law. Illegal. Unlawful. Illegal. Mm -hmm. Illicit. Hence, immoral. Now, when I look this up in the Greek, basically, it means lawless. Not acceptable based on the prevailing custom or ordinary practice, which translates to not righteous. First, first John 3, 4 through 6. Can I get that in the NIV, please? First John 3, verse 4 through 6. Illegal, by meaning lawless, 
when I hooked it up, um, I was reminded of the scripture in Ezekiel 28, 15, where it talks about um, how Lucifer was perfect in the day that he was created until iniquity was found in him. When I look up iniquity, it also means lawless. So being illegal and being full of iniquity are the same, both of which are in reference to the devil. Iniquity in the Greek is lawlessness, disobedience, and sin. The devil is an illegal because he is lawless. He is the man of sin. He is the originator of sin. However, he will, in these last days, be embodied in the Antichrist. Now, Romans, well, first of all, 1 John 3, 4 through 6 in the NIV. Everyone who sins breaks the law. Everyone who sins breaks the law. What law? What law? So, okay, so basically we, we know that, yeah, essentially it's God's law. The law of life. The law of love. Because there are a lot of laws out there. Okay, well, we're talking about, yes, God's law, the, God, the law of life. So everyone who sins breaks the law of God, breaks the law of life, breaks the law of love, because God is all of those. Okay, go ahead. In fact, uh -huh. sin is lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Sin is. And the devil is the man of lawlessness, because he's the one who originated this in his first act of rebellion against God. Okay, go ahead. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. Okay, so Jesus appeared in order to take away our sins, and that's because what happened was that when the devil sinned against God, and then he deceived Eve so that now Adam and Eve would sin, he caused that sin to pass, uh, Adam that is, caused that sin to pass across all mankind, yep. which means all of us were lawless. Yep. So just think about that. All of us were lawless, which means that at one point, all of us were illegal. But the thing is, when we were created, we were very much legal. That's why scripture says that at one point we were strangers and foreigners. We were alienated from God. So at one point, when we were with God originally, before the devil sinned, we were perfect, legal. Then the devil hoodwinked Adam and Eve into sinning. So now lawlessness passed across all mankind, which means all of us were illegal. Then Jesus came and he made us legal again. Amen. Okay, continue. And in him is no sin. And in him, Jesus, is no sin. Uh huh. No one who lives in him mm -hmm. keeps on sinning. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. Read that verse again. Hmm. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. So this is the thing. If you're still committing sin, otherwise known as transgressions against your righteousness, that's like trying to say it's possible to be illegal but live in Christ at the same time. That's like trying to say that you're living in darkness but yet you think that you can still be in the light at the same time. That's not possible. It's one or the other, which means that when we say that we come to Christ, then that means that we have to abandon anything from the old life. And then when we come in Christ, we have to cease whatever it was that we were doing in the old life. That means that when it comes to the world and their agenda, when it comes to this LGBTQ, this what they call 
alternative lifestyle. If you say that you agree with that, you're in darkness, which means that you can't expect to be able to call on God who's light and he answer you if you agree with that. Go ahead. No one who continues to sin uh-huh. has either seen him or known him. Okay, which is me. If he's saying that anyone who continues in sin hasn't seen him and hasn't known him, then uh, that also means that if you're continuing in sin, he can't recognize you as a son. Okay? Were you done? Yes. Okay. Now, Romans spells this out quite clear. Verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you ashamed of the gospel? No. Say, I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed. Of the gospel. Of the gospel. Of Christ. of Christ, for it is, for it is the, power the power of God, of God unto, unto salvation, salvation. Because, because I believe. I believe. Good. Amen. Verse 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and forfeited beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to be un- gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creator more than the creature rather served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever amen for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. Okay, now I want us to continue and actually start going back through some of this in the version that I put this in. I think it was in the NIV that I put this version. No? 
Romans 8? No, that's not it. NIV? Let me get the NIV. For, let's start, because I'm going to kind of pick this apart a little bit. Let me see, where's my breakdown here? That's a different breakdown. Okay, let's start in the NIV with... Verse 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Okay, now what he means there is God has put himself on display simply by creation. Who made the sky? Who made all these trees out here? Okay, now somebody can say, no, 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 I planted that tree. Okay, with whose seed? Oh, my mama gave me the seed. Who'd she get it from? Okay, look, we can go all day. We can go all day long, okay? But ultimately, who is the one who originated that seed? Who is the one that originated the soil? Okay, who is the one that makes it grow? God. It's be look, it's not because you watered it and because you exposed it to the sun. No, it's because God commanded the water to make it grow. And God commanded the sun to make it grow. That's why when we water it, it grows. And that's why when it's exposed to the sun, it grows. Because God commanded those elements to do that. Without his command, you could water all day and it would die. Go ahead. For although they knew God. So we're talking about religious people. Not those who have a relationship, those who are religious because they knew him. Go ahead. They neither glorified him as God. Mm -hmm. nor gave thanks to him, uh -huh. but their thinking became futile. Became futile. What is futile? Useless. Hmm? Useless. Fruitless, useless, okay? Empty, worthless. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> and their foolish hearts were darkened. Foolish hearts were darkened. Go ahead. Although they claimed to be wise. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. They became fools. They became, which means they weren't a fool before. They just chose to be. They chose to be. It says became. It means they did not start a fool. They started smart, but then they became a fool. Okay, by their own choice. Go ahead. And exchanged the glory of the immortal God... Uh -huh. For images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Which means that they had the right thing initially and exchanged it for a perversion of the right thing. They gave up the right thing for a perversion of the right thing. Okay? Therefore... God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts mm -hmm. to sexual impurity mm -hmm. for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep going. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Okay, which means they had the truth before. Yeah. And they gave up the truth to receive a lie. Yeah. Look, I said light was on the scene first. Light is always on the scene first. Any child who is raised, initially, they're going to know that something is not right between two men being their parents or two women being their parents. But then expose it to them long enough and they will become dark. But they started in the light because God put it in them. The animal kingdom even knows that. Uh, 
<laughs> what does your Romans 1.18 say in the NIV? The wrath of God uh -huh. is being revealed from heaven uh -huh. against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth okay. by their wickedness. Okay. I needed to write down that that was an NIV. That's one thing I didn't write down. Okay, because he had me hold on to that word suppress. Suppress. Write this down. Suppress, by description, to conceal. C suppress, not to reveal. Suppress to prevent publication of. Suppress, to overpower and crush. Suppress, to subdue. Suppress, to put down. Suppress, to keep in. Suppress, to restrain from utterance. Suppress, to stop. Suppress to restrain. Suppress to stifle. Suppress to hinder from circulation. Suppress to obstruct. Suppress to destroy. Anybody who is signing on with this agenda you can't suppress the truth unless you know first what the truth is. So anyone who subscribes to this agenda, they already know that the truth is that marriage and sex is between a man and a woman. And if it's marriage, it should be between a married man and a married woman. Why else would they go to such lengths to try and get the law of the land on their side to marry them? Because that is a tactic of the devil to produce a substitute, which is a perversion. Why do you have to get married? Because the devil is always after duplicating and perverting. He is always after an alternative. He is always after a substitute. He is always after taking what God has created and then perverting it. Otherwise, why would you need to insist that you have to be married? It's because it is a devilish copy is what it is. So then what they're going to do is they're going to want to suppress, which is what they're doing now, suppress the truth. See, we're not going to talk about Romans 1 in churches that agree with this. We're not going to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah in churches that agree with this. But I just need for it to be put on record. This church is not on board with that and never will be. See, when he says that upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail, it's this type of church. It's this type of church, okay? So I don't care what the law of the land says, okay? How in God's name are two men going to produce an offspring? Look. There is a law when it comes to the physical body, okay? This is an entrance. Food goes in, okay? That is an exit. And it was never supposed to be used as an entrance, all right? I'm making it plain. And that's because that's where it needs to be plain, is in the church, okay? That is an exit, okay? That is a disposal. Okay, it is for waste and fecal matter. Biology will tell us this. Basic biology that I learned in school said that whatever goes in needs to come out, which means nothing needs to be going in there. 
it is a violation of the natural law. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. I just wanted to say that the skin in the area of our body where the exit is, yes. is extremely thin. Huh. So um, when people engage in sexual imperf- <laughs> impurities, sexual impurities, um, it's much easier for them to pass along diseases because the skin is thin, yeah. and so any disease that the person has, it will be easily transmitted to the other person and received yes. by that person. Yes, yes. Matter of fact, um, you can get cancer in that area doing that. Nobody's supposed to get cancer down there. Right. Come on, people. Right. That at a basic level, you don't even need, need to be born again to figure this out, okay? At a basic level, anybody knows that is for outgoing. Right. Only. 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 Not to mention, when you use the exit as an entrance, then that is where the word sodomy comes from. And the word sodomy comes from Sodom. Because that is what they did. And it wasn't just anal sex, but oral sex. And that's because they were attempting to utilize the mouth as a vagina, which it is not. So no, oral sex should not be on the books, whether you're married or not. Because that is not a God idea. Now... You all need time to recuperate? Okay. Now the reason why he's telling me that all of this is important, and I'm sort of kind of fast tracking a little bit, a lot of the scriptures and stuff I haven't had a chance to really go to, but for sake of time. The reason why he's telling me this is is important is because of what I said the first time. You can't bind what you permit. And you can't bind what you agree with. And then if you remain a silent partner, then you look, as far as God is concerned, you just agree with them, just as the rest who are vocal about it. Um, and that is they're becoming also very pushy about it. Okay, my thing is, if you want to be lawless like that and be lumped in with the devil, then you just do it and don't push it on me. And that's because that's illegal. Okay, so don't try and make what is illegal legal. Because it is a perversion of what is legal. And it's never going to be right. God is never going to sanction it. It's never going to be dignified. Ever. So anybody who calls themselves a minister who is facilitating in those types of unions, they are going to hell with them too. Romans tells us that. Okay? Now, 2 Thessalonians. And I'm really compressing it here. Um, however, let me see here. Where am I? Let's see what verse. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay. And I'll just start from verse 1. Can I get this read in the CJ, please? Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's start with verse 1. But in connection with the coming of our Lord Yeshua, the Messiah, and our gathering together to meet him, we ask you, brothers, not to be easily shaken in your thinking or anxious because of a spirit or a spoken message or a letter supposedly from us claiming that the day of the Lord has already come. Okay, so what was happening here is that there were people who were forging letters in Paul's name and writing to the church telling them that basically the rapture had come already. And Paul is writing to let them know, first of all, that letter didn't come from me, and second of all, they are wrong. Go ahead. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. Okay, he says, don't let anyone deceive you. Go ahead. 
for the day will come for the day will not come until after the apostasy has come and the man who separates himself from Torah has been revealed. Okay. He says don't the day won't come until the apostasy occurs. The apostasy is basically a falling away. Okay? So a lot of people will fall away, including unfortunately people in the church. They are going to fall away in the last days and they are going to go from a position of being anti that to embracing it. And it's happening every day. Churches and another minister is saying, well, you know, maybe we should be more, more, more tolerant and, you know, more welcoming and, um, you know, ministers should be able to, uh, to be either a homosexual or a lesbian or, you know, what have you. More and more, they're becoming accepting and tolerant of it. Now, listen, first of all, let me say this. For any homosexual, any lesbian, anyone who's like that, I don't hate them. And I don't hate you. I love you as God loves you. But I am allowed to hate your lifestyle because God does. And all he wants is for them to renounce that, abandon that, and come to him. That is all. It's a very simple fix. However, it is also essential that you're in a ministry where you can receive deliverance from that thing and then learn how to change your people, places, practices, habits, mindset, and appetites in accordance with who you truly are in Christ. And that's because even for someone who decides that they want to trans from a male to a female, a male is still a male. I don't care what you do. And a female is still a female. I don't care what you do. You can have whatever added or removed. The fact is, God determined your gender when you were in the womb. And we discovered what it was when you were born. So if you had a penis, you're a man. If you had a vagina, you are a female. I should have said a male. If you had a penis, you're a male. You grow to be a man. Or you're supposed to, okay? That does not change, okay? What does need to happen, though, is that sometimes parents or a single parent, they, I'm not bashing single moms, okay? So don't take this wrong. But that is why also, if you're a single mom, church is essential, Okay, because if you're a single mom and there isn't a man in the home, they need to be around men, godly men, so that they can learn how to act like a man. Okay, don't effeminize your son. And that's because if you effeminize your son, then he's going to think now that he was supposed to be female. He needs to be surrounded with other godly men so he can learn to be a man because that is what he is. And for the female, unless she understands true love coming from her natural father, then she's going to seek for it from another female who is as emotional as she is. And that is fouled up and wrong. The love that they need should first come from their father. If that is not possible, the father isn't saved, or he isn't on the scene, then that's why it's essential for that family to be in the church so now she can witness and see what a true father should be like. And then single parents don't get offended when godly men and women speak into your life and want to help you with your children. We're not trying to take them from you. We're trying to help you raise them to be godly seed. It don't take anything from you. You are still their mama and you are still their daddy. But you need help. Look, two parents need help. Why wouldn't one? Is there a question? Um, my question is, I, I heard you say that we have to speak against things that we oppose. Now, I also heard you say it's just as bad as we're silent to those that, things that we oppose. Why do we have to 
why is it important for us to speak when we can just be quiet and not get involved? If somebody confronts me about that and wants to push something on me when it comes to this, I'm going to speak. Okay. Am I saying that I walk into and every time I see somebody who may be a guy who's walking way more feminine than even I do, <laughs> that I'm just going to go up to them and just rattle off? Now, if the Holy Spirit tells me to tell something to them, then I will. Again, this is where I have to put out there, you have to do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. And whatever you do, make sure you do it in the love of God. Okay, you do. And that's why it's essential to have the Holy Spirit. Okay, and that's because there are times when I had a thought come to me, but I thought ah, that's probably just the way I'm feeling. However, the Holy Spirit just kept pushing it. And so I did. Now, mind you, at the same time, I demonstrated to them that, listen, God loves you. However, what you think you want to become, that's not what you were born to be. That's a deception. And you will be miserable until you come to that reality. Okay? So I speak in love when he tells me to. However, I definitely will say something if they try and push it on me. And I'm going to let them know. And it's not the gospel of Nicole. I'm going to say, you know what? You wouldn't feel the need to push and insist on something like that if you didn't know it was wrong. Otherwise, why would the truth offend you so much? Yes. Pastor Nick, may I give an example to Sister Karen's question? Yes. So there is, um, in particular, a client with whom we work who has made the decision that her name is a male name. She will curse and carry on if someone calls her by her given name, which I continue to do. Yes. I refuse yes. to call her by any other name, and I let her know that. The speaking part, so that's, that's one thing. But the, the other pieces of that is that um, other social workers, supervisors, managers have tried to push that hospital officials, well, sh he says, and they will over-talk me by saying, he said, I said, she is not he because she still has female parts. And that is what she will be called unless she legally changes her name. Legally. Yes. Legally. Mm -hmm. Then I will call her by her legal, legal name. name. But until then, she is who she is, and that is how I will address her. Please do not try to get me to do otherwise. Right. 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 In love. That's right. In love. In love. But it's with, it's with conviction. Okay, and that's because they ought to walk away queasy. All right, because that is sick. Okay, so you ought to be vocal and share the truth and what your position is when it comes to God's law. God's law, yes. Yes. Uh, Pastor, it's not really a question, but, well, I guess it is. If you're a parent mm -hmm. and your children is engaging in that bad practice or, mm -hmm. and was raised in the church, now it's different with Sister Wanda and somebody not, you know, really knowing them the way you know your child. So other than praying, which you are a person I'm sure is doing, what, what would that parent go even further as to help their child come to the realization of who they are? Okay. You really want me to answer this question? 
Okay, now, first of all, we have to take a look at what age. Now, this is also providing that both parents are on the same page when it comes to God's law, okay? And that they're training up the child in the way that they should go as far as, far as God's law. So let's just for the sake of the conversation, because this can go a number of different ways, but let's just for the sake of the conversation say that there is a father and there is a mother and that they are married and they are in the home and they agree with God's word and God's law, okay? And that whatever this child is feeling, I'm going to attribute it to maybe pressures outside the home and that's because they push this on children in school, okay? Now, parents, what would be a simple fix? Simple fix. If they're coming home talking different, or as we said, strange, and you know that you did not instill that, and they're getting it from outside the home, what do you do? And they're young. School them at the house. It's either another school or we're homeschooling. Look, if you're going to be having kids these days, you ought to be prepared to homeschool them. That's just where we are. Okay? Now, if they're in the home and they're older, and when I say older, maybe like 18 and above, okay, they know this isn't right, but they continue to do this then you are going to have to find someplace else to live. The book does say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And your home is a satellite location of the church. Tough bill to swallow, but it's the truth. Look, telling them that they need to live someplace else, that's actually nice. Do you know how God handled stuff like this under the old covenant? I do. I do. They would be taken into the middle of the town and stoned to death. So you tell them you're going to have to find someplace else to live and that's because we're not going to be divided in this house over that. And then you pray for them. And this is why being filled with the Holy Spirit and knowing how to pray in tongues is essential and it's very, very important, okay? But you do as much as you can and you introduce and show them these scriptures like I'm showing you right here, right now, so they can see it's in the book. Now, if they decide that they are just going to be bent on doing whatever they want to do and they want to go to hell, there ain't anything that you can do to stop them. Look, if God can't, what makes you think you can? A lot of times it's harder, I see in most cases, it's harder for older children, upper teens, early 20s, to change from this when their parents have been soft peddling it. And they haven't insisted that they make changes in this area. But when they're too accommodating and too welcoming and they don't want to hurt their feelings and, and they don't want them to feel like they're rejected. And uh, look, you can't make someone like this feel rejected. They have decided to be rejected already by rejecting the truth. It said, my, look, people want to put the scripture out there all the time, but then they don't want to finish it. They say, my people perish for lack of knowledge. They perish for lack of knowledge because they've rejected God. Nobody wants to put that in there. It says it in the book. Find it. It says it in the book. My people perish for lack of knowledge because they have rejected me. That is what it says. So anybody who feels rejected, you're not rejecting them. Rejection, true rejection in its purest sense is when a person rejects the truth. So when they reject the truth, they will feel rejected. 
True rejection is when one rejects the truth. It's not for, it doesn't happen any other way. Okay? So if they say, well, I don't want them to feel rejected. I don't want to disown them. I don't want to let them. You know, they're going through, look, they're making all kinds of excuses. You're making excuses that God is not going to accept. So you're actually setting them up and you're, you're enabling them and facilitating their transport to hell. Instead of enforcing the scripture and gently pushing them to judge themselves in this life. And that's because if they don't judge themselves in this life and make that correction in this life, they're not going to be able to later. Yes. Hosea 4, 6. Hosea 4, 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because. Because. Thou hast. Thou hast. Rejected knowledge. Rejected knowledge. And in this case, it's the knowledge of the truth. So the parish and the rejection comes because one rejects the truth. It doesn't happen any other way. Hosea 4, 6. Six. Yes. Does that answer the question? Okay. Male out the fraud is male and female. A male can do what a female can do. A female can do what a male can do. You're absolutely right about that. That's right. Not even physically capable of doing that. Okay, Second Thessalonians, let's pick up where we left off. There's something I want to get to before we get out of here. Pass. Yes. Yeah, I was listening and, and uh, agree with everything you say. But I think that we have to go back. We can't wait till they get to be 15, 16, 21. No. No. You got to have them in Sunday school. Yes. yes. You start them with know the truth that shall make you free. You start with Jesus loves me, this I know. What does that mean? Hey, he really does, and you wouldn't be here without him. But you can't wait till somebody's 15 and 16 and says, well, that's wrong. Throw him out the door. That's not what you're saying. I understand that. Right. And I certainly know what I believe. But you got to start young. Mm -hmm. Where are the grandchildren in Sunday school, the great grandchildren, the neighbor's mm -hmm. children? Mm -hmm. Get those children away from their computers, away from the little telephones. Mm -hmm. Get them back into Sunday school where they can learn as children mm -hmm. as we all had to. Mm -hmm. And I still forget and mess up. And I'm 83 years old, but I love children. And I think that we need to get them back in the church when they're little every Sunday morning. Yes. 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 Hence the teaching on the church, okay? And that especially for single parents, but also for, for two-parent homes, you got to cut, we have to assemble, and we got to get this truth. And then we do what God originally intended. You take the word that is enforced here, and you re-enforce at home. So you take what is enforced here and then you reinforce at home. And that is why God even told, there's a question or a hand back there. That is why God even told Moses, for example, under the Mosaic law, he said, tell them to teach these principles, statutes, and laws to their children and to their children's children every single day. So they didn't spend, and even to this day, don't spend a whole lot of time on this. Okay? Not to mention when they're in front of a screen, whether a laptop screen, phone screen, TV screen, whatever the case is, you don't know what all is coming at them. Look, the devil breaks homes down from the inside, not the outside. He breaks it down from the inside. He just needs someone to facilitate it. 
but he's going to break it down from the inside. The gospel tells us that. How can you bind a strong man's house except you first bind the strong man inside the house? Yes. How do you deal with an anomaly? I had a friend when I lived in Texas who was born with both organs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is demonic. And I can tell you of a certainty that that is as a result of a generational curse. I even know situations where a sorcerer or something spoke something over a family member, but it didn't show up until a few lines down the road. So that's as a result of some witchcraft that's been at, at work. Now generally what I understand in situations like that is that they, they, in some cases, they would see what perhaps would be the proclivity or whatever, and then they would conduct a surgery to remove whichever I guess was not the most dominant or something like that. You can speak to that more professionally possibly. So yeah, it's true that sometimes um, even though a person may have the genetics for XX making them a female or the genetics for XY making them a male, sometimes there is an extra chromosome um, and so it skews things and the hormones that need to get released uh, for making a complete male like testosterone, the levels aren't where they need to be. And the same is true for estrogen. Uh, so when that happens, sometimes they actually look at the patient and say, okay, they have what looks more like a female. And then to your point, they go that route. Right. And vice versa. Right. And then in that case, it's the parent's responsibility to rear that child accordingly. Okay. And not to make them think that, well, because you were born with both, you could go either way. Uh -uh. With the help of the Holy Spirit, you train them to go accordingly. And that's because if we're dealing with godly parents who are, you know, they're with God on this and they're willing to rear that child accordingly, then the deliverance and the break of that curse can happen then. Because God can break whatever curse when permitted. Answer the question. So I wanted to answer your question that you posed earlier. I know we had kind of like discussed it, but whenever you were talking about like if a child comes home like talking funny, like how should the parents respond? So I actually had an encounter with that. And um, I asked my mom before I raised my hand, could I share this? Because she was the one that did it. But um, I had a teacher who called home and told my mom that she thought that I was a lesbian in the second grade. And my mom went up to the school and like, I don't even know what my mom said to her because she paraphrased it, but she like, she, <laughs> but it was like, you know, she, in that moment, she was not Sister Teresa. She was a warrior for me because she was not about to let, first of all, somebody who barely knows me and somebody who probably didn't even have a strong relationship with Christ, even though I was at a Christian school, tell me that I was a lesbian at, at like, what, eight? Like, I could have internalized that had I not had the parents that I had. And, I mean, I'm not going to say that that would have been what I became, but you don't know because children are so impressionable. Mm -hmm. And so I just feel like having strong parents who have a standard set for their kids and are not going to let people put labels on them and aren't afraid to go to the school and stand against the teachers because I think parents forget they're the parent and not the teacher and they have rights. That's right. Um, it definitely helps. Mm -hmm. So I just think that like having strong parents who are not worried about inclusivity and being like palatable mm -hmm. is a really big factor in that. Of course it is. Of course it is. Godly parents producing godly seed because that is not an easy job, but it's a doable one Amen. with the Holy Spirit's help. Yes. Continue. For the day will not come until after the apostasy has come, and the man who separates himself from the Torah has been revealed. 
So we're saying the man who separates himself from the Torah is going to be revealed as the Antichrist. If it tells you that this is a man who separates himself from the Torah, what kind of man is this? What kind of man separates himself from the Torah? Do you know what the Torah is? It's God's law. If we're talking about someone who separates himself from it, what kind of person is that? No, that's what he became, but he wasn't that before. This is a religious man who embraced the Torah. He embraced God's law, but then he chose to separate himself from it. Go ahead. The one destined for doom. The one destined to doom. For doom. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. He will oppose himself to everything that people call a god or make an object of worship. He will oppose himself basically to anything that is truth. Okay? Even though the Antichrist has not yet been revealed, the quote-unquote spirit of the Antichrist is present. Indeed. Indeed. Okay, go ahead. He will put himself above them all. Okay. So that he will sit in the temple of God and proclaim that he himself is God. So he's going to call himself God. Go ahead. Don't you remember that when I was still with you, I used to tell you these things? Mm -hmm. And now you know what is, rest you know what is restraining. Mm -hmm. So that he may be revealed. He says that you know what is restraining. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try and end on this point. Now, when I read through, I have, a, I have a complete Jewish Bible, which is what Elder Ron is reading from right now. Okay, complete Jewish, which comes closest actually to the original texts. When I read through the complete Jewish, I don't very often read the commentaries. I'm not interested in what anybody else has to say. I just want to know what God has to say. However, I did happen to look down at it in my Bible this time. And when it talked about the one that was restraining, it said that there's actually much discussion regarding who the restrainer is. They're saying it could be anywhere from God to Jesus to the Holy Spirit to the devil himself or to Rome. Rome, that's a mute issue. Doesn't even make any sense. The devil, why would he want to restrain the Antichrist? The Antichrist is him in, in embodiment. He's what gives the devil a body, which is what the devil's been after all this time. So it wouldn't be him. Okay, so basically, I'm just going to just drop it on you right here, right now. What is restraining the Antichrist from being revealed and not and restraining and keeping this world from going to hell? Is God in the person of the Holy Spirit who's in the earth through the church? You can't restrain it if you agree with it. So it would seem that the number of churches who fall in this category are diminishing. It doesn't mean, though, that God's power is. As long as he has one, that's all he needs. You just need to decide you're going to be the one. Okay, and that's because this is where we live. All right, they're pushing it on people, they're pushing it on the children, and they have an agenda. And I actually heard them say it that their goal is to corrupt the seed, and they are intentionally going after the seed. Now this is my thing, and hopefully this is lastly. If the devil, through them, is intentionally going after the seed, what do you think the church should be doing? Intentionally going after the seed. Hence the Great Commission, and hence the purpose of the church. And that's because God is the one who is restraining through us 
But later on, next time, we'll find out that at some point, he is going to remove us and there will no longer be any restraint. Any questions? Yes. Pastor, I, I, I totally receive what you say about the seed because I went into Whole Foods looking for grapes with seed. They said we no longer carry those. Right. That's Whole Foods. Yes. <laughs> yes. Whole Foods which is supposed to be a health food store. That's right. Okay, but you can get them at the farmer's market and got some I know, yesterday. I know, I know. Go straight down for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he's after the seed, not only naturally, but spiritually. Okay, and that's because the seed is everything. You can't do anything without a seed. And that's why even God knew that. Oh, that's seed. That's why God knew that. So that's why when he says in John 1, in the beginning was the word. The word is the seed. It's God's seed. That's right. So even God has a seed. And that seed is the word. Even he knew that. Even he knew that. So he had his own seed from the beginning because he knows he can't get anything without a seed. So you go out and you go after that seed and you go make disciples, you go convert people. That's why we're here. We should not be satisfied saying I'm saved, everybody else can go to hell. Because if you're not discipling, that's basically what you're saying. That's basically what you're saying. Is I'm good, the rest of you can go to hell. Do not do that. Do not do that. Because he demands we produce fruit. It is a command, not an option, not a suggestion, a command. So go and make the family big, okay? Because when you do, it makes God happy because that's what he wants. So thank you, Holy Spirit of God, for your spirit of boldness and conviction as these people go forth and make disciples for you and make you proud and make you rich with souls. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.